Today on the bench, we have a Tascam 414 Mark II. First, let's see if it powers on. And it doesn't. Is it just the power LED? No, it's not. All right, let's open her up. Step one, take off all of these knobs. It's not technically necessary to get inside, but they'll need to be cleaned anyway, so we might as well. After that, we remove the eight screws from the back. And don't forget the one hiding in the cassette bay. And then we can open her up. I like to pull the two halves apart slightly to loosen the pitch knob before removing it. After separating the two halves, we just unplug the wires connecting them and we're inside. The power socket looks solid, so it hasn't cracked loose. That's not likely the problem, but it looks like there's a little crud around the main bypass capacitor in the power section, so I have a suspicion it's failed. To find out, we'll have to finish taking the task cam apart. We start by unscrewing the tape transport. There are five screws. Don't miss the one holding the motor assembly down. With the screws out, we can unplug the main plug and then leave it set aside while we take the rest of the screws out holding the main board into the case. Now we can carefully lift the assembly free. Looking at the bottom of the board, there's some additional evidence of capacitor leakage along the edge near the suspect capacitor. Let's flip the board back over and get the transport totally disconnected, and then see about this capacitor. You can test a capacitor without removing it from the circuit if you use an equivalent series resistance or ESR meter. This works by putting a 10 kHz square wave through the capacitor and measuring the result. The camera didn't really catch the screen here, but the value is about half of what was expected, so the capacitor is bad. I'll use my Hako FR300 to desolder the capacitor. Make short work of through-hole components like this. Now the capacitor pulls out clean and easy. While I'm at it, I'll also flux and reflow all the joints in the area I think the capacitor leaked onto. The traces look undamaged, but I like to touch up the solder in cases like this, just in case. With the replacement capacitor in, it's time to plug the unit back together enough to test. And it works. Now, let's change the belts. You can see that the three belts aren't in terrible shape, but when laid out, they should go back to being totally round. The two main drive belts are slightly out of round and have some lumpy bits to them, so they definitely need to be changed. The counter belt is quite out of round and stretched, but that's common on the 414 series. The belt replacement process is relatively straightforward on the 414. There's nothing strange to, to thread it through, and no cramped spaces to work in, although the tape counter belt is always a little finicky.
All done. Now that the unit finally powers on, let's get it together enough to test the audio channels and recording. I've cut it out of this video, but before testing the recording and playback, I will try out all the knobs and sliders to make sure none of them are crackly or damaged. On this one, everything was remarkably clean. The potentiometers moved smoothly and silently, and so did the sliders, so nothing needed cleaning. All the inputs seem to work, and hopefully so does recording. And so does the return to zero function. Great. Unfortunately, on playback, there's something off with channel 3. Nothing comes out. Before opening it back up to check it out, let's clean the heads. On the 414, the easiest way to do this is to press play with the power off. This brings the heads up into an accessible position where they can be washed with a Q-tip and the highest proof rubbing alcohol you have available. Taking a look inside, I can see that one of the little wires on the channel 3 connector has broken off. I'm not sure if it was like that to begin with, or if I damaged it myself, but these things happen. I'll just have to repair it by soldering it back into place. With the connector repaired, we can put the unit back together and get to cosmetic cleaning. I like to give everything a wipe down with regular water on a paper towel first. Then I come back through with dry q-tips to clean out the wells around the knobs and sliders. If any dirt is especially persistent, I'll come back with some alcohol, but this one cleaned up pretty easily. It's just a bit of dust, maybe a little bit of caked in dirt. Moving on to the knobs, even after cleaning in soap and water, they were still discolored, so it's time to break out the Retrobrite. This is actually a developer sold by a beauty supply company for hair, but for this use, it's just a high potency hydrogen peroxide turned into a cream. We just add the parts to a Ziploc bag, add some of the developer, and squish it around. When everything is thoroughly saturated, it goes into a UV source. This one is actually intended for curing gel nails. Leave it in there for about three hours. After the knobs come out, they're back to their original color, and with a wash and dry, we're ready to reinstall them. This is probably the easiest but most tedious part of the entire refurbishment.
Once everything is back together, we can move on to calibration. For this step, we'll take a 1 kHz, 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak sine wave from my function generator and use it as an audio source. This should give us a line level 0 decibel reference signal to work with. So we turn down all the input trimmers all the way down and set the slider to the middle of the shaded area between 7 and 8. At this point, we should expect the VU meters to show about 0 decibels on each channel in turn. Most of the channels look good on input levels, but 2 is just on the edge of being low. Now let's play back what we recorded and see if the calibration level is correct. Nope. Looks like channel 4 is good, but all the other channels are just a bit low on output. That's most likely the result of aging capacitors changing their values. On some decks, this can only be fixed by recapping the entire audio path, but luckily here we have trimmers which can be used to recalibrate for these changed values. Once again, we open the unit up, but this time, the top and bottom halves have to remain wired together, so we get to engage in an awkward balancing act. We need to leave the tape playing so we can watch the VU levels, but we also need to use a small screwdriver bit to adjust the trimmers on the board until the VU output level gives us the same 0 dB that we had as the input. The board in the 414 is laid out in a fairly straightforward way. Each audio channel is laid out in a row, and the channels are stacked up in a single column with channel 1 on the bottom and channel 4 on the top. Each channel has three trimmers. Record, which affects the level at the preamp stage, play, which affects the level on playback, and dbx, which somehow affects dbx noise reduction. I don't touch that one. Here, we're adjusting the play trimmer to get our output to 0 dB on each channel. Now that it's all fixed up, the only thing left to do is a test recording across each channel. This is a hard process, trying to sync up pausing the source and the recorder at the same time, and what I have here is far from perfect. I used an old tape, wasn't a very great tape, but it does give you the opportunity to listen to some great music on cassette and show that each channel works now. So please enjoy A Revelation by Jeremy Blake, also known as Red Means Recording, taken from the YouTube Audio Library.